Welcome to Question Time. Tonight, we are in Cambridge. On tonight's panel, Grant Shapps, the government's transport secretary and former chair of the Conservative Party. Labour's shadow justice secretary, a trained barrister and an MP for more than 20 years, David Lammy. Manira Wilson, elected in 2019, currently the Liberal Democrat spokesperson on health, well-being and social care. US-born journalist and former director of communications at the Institute of Economic Affairs, now economics correspondent for the right-leaning Spectator magazine, Kate Andrews. And here to tell us why Christmas may be under threat, eco-warrior and boss of the supermarket chain Iceland, Richard Walker. Welcome to, to the panel, welcome to all of you here and of course welcome to you at home as well. If you want to join the conversation, do in the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time. Right, our first question tonight is from Anna Anderson. With energy prices and inflation increasing, is it fair to take £20 a week away from the poorest in our society? Anna, what's your view on this since you asked the question? Well, I don't think it's fair. Um, I work for the community and I see an uh, increased number of parents and families uh, accessing their food banks and uh, accessing their holiday lunches and, and it's just getting worse. And it's a bit of a shame that the sixth richest economy in, in, in the world is there's so many people who are struggling. David. It's brutally unfair. It's cruel, it's mean, it's nasty. If you're a carer, and thank God for our carers in the last 18 months. Um, or you're a nurse, or you're a, you work in a prison, and you've kept COVID from breaking out right across the prison. Um, you're on 18,000 pounds a year. That cut means 1,100 a year that you now have to pay. It's actually the cost of the average energy bill. Um, so this is a huge cost to my constituents and many millions of people across the country. And it's a choice. And it's coming alongside an increase, of course, in national insurance. Economists are predicting an inflation rise uh, and certainly interest rates going up by next February. So this is mean, it's nasty, it's unnecessary, and there should have been a U-turn. So the cost of it, <laughs> keeping the cost of it there, would be about £6 billion a year. So how would you suggest paying for that? We said that we would replace universal credit and we wouldn't do this. Uh, we've also said so How would you pay for it? Whatever you replace it with, how are you going to find the money? We are some way before an election. We will cost that election. We will not be going into a general election with uncosted proposals. So you're just saying, don't know how we're going to pay for it, but uh, we'll do it first. No, I'm really clear. My job is to oppose this government, and particularly when it comes to the poorest people in our country, and particularly for my constituents. All Labour members, all Labour MPs agree on that. This is not up for debate. Sure. We should but not you, you be still, cutting you universal credit by £20. I've said that we will cost the proposal when we get to the next general election. I guarantee it, Fiona. Is it fair to take £20 a week away from the poorest in society, Grant? First of all, um, we all want to make sure that everyone in society uh, has money to get through the coronavirus and now back, get back into jobs. And that's why we spend over £400 billion on families, on individuals, on businesses throughout the coronavirus. And we knew that we, uh, when we included the, uh, the uplift in universal credit, we said it was for a temporary period. It was during coronavirus in the same way that furlough, for example, is coming to an end this month because that was during the coronavirus. And one of the good things that's happened is we see more people in employment now than before coronavirus. We see more job opportunities, uh, more uh, job openings than even before uh, coronavirus, in fact, ever. Uh, but people now. are now and facing a perfect storm. Within, the Bank of England is predicting inflation could rise uh, above 4%. As we know, all know now, because there's so much on the news about it, energy prices... Uh, our, our bills are going to go yeah. up and you're taking money yeah. away as well. But, uh, so the situation also, has changed. Also, we've seen salaries go up actually by a bit more than 4%. Uh, and this is not the only thing that we did for coronavirus. So, for example, a local housing allowance is remaining, even though the increase was brought in for coronavirus. We've got children additions and allowances. We've expanded the working allowance. We've uh, introduced... Uh, uh, healthy start vouchers and increase the amount of money that goes for ch children costs uh, uh, being covered uh, up from 70 to 80% through the universal 
uh, system. So we, we've done a whole lot of things. And your, your point to David was absolutely right. It's cost nine billion to run the increase in universal credit up to now, and it was introduced as a temporary measure. It would carry on, on being another six billion to carry on running. You have to then decide what to do. Do you carry on increasing other taxes? It would be a penny on income tax, three or four p, p on, uh, say, uh, the cost of fuel. If you were to do that, well, that would increase the cost of living. So there are choices to make, and a government can't wait until the next election have to, to make choices. OK, let's hear from our audience. Quite a few hands up. Yes, the man in the black shirt. Hi, Grant. Um, do you still think it's acceptable that any British citizen should be visiting a food bank in the first place? No. Uh, Grant, I'm going to get round the audience and I'll come back to you. Yes, the woman here in the middle with the glasses. So, for people like me who are chronically ill, how do you justify cutting the £20 a week for people that can't get back into work and things are rising, like energy bills and rent? So, just tell us a little bit about your situation, then. Um, so, I suffer with multiple chronic illnesses. Um, so, my conditions fluctuate a lot. So, I struggle with work, uh, especially full-time work. So, yeah. <laughs> So, so, so that money would mean a lot it to does, you? Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm sorry to, to hear that about your illnesses. Yes, a lady here in the yellow card. So you've mentioned quite a few initiatives that you're doing, but it's not working. People are still struggling and using food banks. So you need to revisit it and, and do more. If it was a large corporation or someone who was well off, you'd care. It just seems like you don't care about people who are poor and struggling. That's what it seems like. That's, it seems like the government doesn't care. Do you want to reply to that? I mean, because the thing is, you've sat and you have listed a whole load of initiatives, mm. but you're hearing people say, well, so what? The fact is, it doesn't feel like that to us. Yeah, uh, look, uh, first of all, the number of people in absolute poverty, I'm pleased to say, has been falling and has continued to um, fall. And that's because we've done things for people who are in work. Uh, for example, the national living wage, which didn't even exist when we came into power. That's actually increased people's salary at the lower end by £4,000 a year. It was not even a, a thing. Uh, now, I understand about the points that the lady was saying about not being in work uh, and therefore the other uh, benefits which would need to uh, be there uh, to help provide uh, help and support. But we, of course, we all want to help people in society. I mean, I actually accept, by the way, that everybody, the, the other politicians on this panel, want to do the same thing as well. Of course we do. This was introduced for a specific purpose over the coronavirus. We're coming to the end of that in the same way as we come to the end of furlough. If we want to carry on doing things, we have to be able to pay for those things as well. And okay. uh, we, as I say, we boosted up other benefits in order to help people through okay. what's been a difficult period. Okay. Yeah, it does feel like there's something in intrinsically unfair about this, like it's a cliff edge for those who are most vulnerable, but who are also trying to work, trying to earn an income and just not quite getting there. Um, as Grant says, we are in dangerous territory if emergency measures from COVID get rolled into, over into normal public policy without a debate, without a discussion about it. The government was very generous and spent a lot of money on paying people's wages through furlough, of increasing welfare. Now we have to separate that policy from the pandemic and have a proper discussion about if we want to prioritize this, how far up the priority list is it, how are we going to fund it, and what are we potential? What resources might we, we move around to do that? Now, now, Dave has said his job is to oppose the government. I do wonder about that when, when it comes to the poorest. I'm well, really clear well, about that. That's I, what I said. I know, yeah, and I, I wonder about that, David, because when it comes to the poorest, I wonder if maybe there's an opportunity here for Conservative and Labour to come together and at least find a temporary solution to this issue. One of them could be that we need to lower Don't the taper. The we need to lower the taper for universal credit rather than giving a twenty-pound handout a week. We could lower the taper from 63p to 50p so that work really is paying more and more. So that when you're going to work, when you're coming home, you get to keep more of that benefit in the first place. And then maybe the Conservatives and Labour could come together and figure out where they're going to find that £6 billion. As Grant says, are you going to put a penny on income tax? Are you going to divert the tax that we're now going to be raising for health and social care? Are you going to divert half of that? These are tough questions that we have to start answering. But perhaps we can actually care about those who are struggling most at the bottom and come together on this one, at least for a temporary period of time, to figure out how we could solve this with, and try to avoid that cliff edge, maybe even using the system as it exists now to change that taper. Richard. Um, no, Anna, I don't think it's right. Um, we, I, I always look at this through the, the sort of lens of our customers. And um, we have a, a thousand shops around the UK, five million customers a week, and many of those are from the poorest communities um, in, in the UK. Some of our customers may rely on benefits to feed their families. Some of our customers might only have 25 quid a week to spend on food. 
so in that context, you, you sort of understand um, how, how this uh, removal of, of the £20 credit will affect them. Of course, at the other end of the equation, this is coming just at the wrong time. Um, now, I think any voter would expect uh, their government to be fiscally prudent, um, but this is going to come at a time where we will see food inflation in the market. Maybe we'll talk about that later. Um, and obviously, we've, we've, there's been a lot in the news about the rising gas prices and energy prices. So for some people, this is a choice between heating and eating. Um, it's, it really is that serious. Uh, the gentleman mentioned the alarming rise in, in food banks. There's now more f food banks than branches of McDonald's in this country. We're a G7 country. How can that be right? Um, so, no, I think this is the wrong timing, and uh, I don't think it's fair. And would you be happy to see income tax go up to pay for it? Yes, I would, yeah. The man there. Do we, do we not think that we're blaming COVID and COVID is just showing the cracks in a system that was already there and wasn't working? <laughs> Veneer, we haven't heard you on this question. Do I think it's fair, Anna, that... Uh, and are we just blaming COVID, as the man says? Well, yeah, uh, well... Uh, we already had a problem before COVID, I, I agree, and there, were all, there was already a record food bank usage before the pandemic. But do I think it's fair on the single mum in my constituency who contacted me who said, I won't be able to take my daughter swimming on occasion? Is that a luxury? Is that a treat to be able to give your child the occasional bit of physical exercise? Do I think it's fair on the disabled woman who contacted me, who said, I'm being told by the Conservative government, just go out and work more hours, um, like this uh, young lady said in the audience. I, she said, I desperately want to work, but I can't because of my physical and mental health conditions. How am I going to get by? As others have said, we've seen energy prices going up, food prices are already going through the roof. And many of these people, because they, a lot of people on universal credit are working, will also be hit by the national insurance rise that's coming in in um, April next year. I mean, the, the average nurse in the NHS is going to be paying £315 more in her, in her tax. So, no, I don't think it's fair. I think it needs to be maintained. I think it's cruel and it's callous. And I think Grant knows that because there have been plenty of his own backbenchers who have also been uh, saying that it needs to be kept. So when Kate says we need a debate, actually, we've had quite a lot of debates. Uh, and there are people in all the parties across the House of Commons who are saying you have to maintain this, otherwise we are going to be plunging people into destitution and poverty. And as somebody in the audience said, in a G7 country, it is utterly unacceptable. Anna. I would say the government developed a, a, a reputation for being quite compassionate in its approach during the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And um, I'm surprised now at the fact that the government is shooting itself in the foot, really, on, on this particular issue. When you responded to the question uh, about what the government was doing, uh, Mr. Shapps, you, you gave a very complicated answer that there were other measures in place. Um, I would, I would counsel the government to reconsider on this measure. It's beholden on us in society to look after those uh, who are in difficulty, like the lady who spoke earlier. And uh, I don't think that the current policy is addressing that. David. Can I just say, it's important to understand that 25% of young people in our country are living in poverty. Child poverty is soaring across Britain. And this is a choice. When this government was asked to act on free school meals, it took a footballer to get the government to act. When this government was asked to have sufficient funds so that children in state schools particularly who'd fallen backwards, uh, the government couldn't find the money, or certainly not enough money, its own czar left the government. Um, when given a choice, the government is always choosing not to side with the poorest in society. I remember it wasn't that long ago that the Conservatives were described as the nasty party. Grant, you can stare at your notes as much as you like. You're not going to find the answers. This cut should not be being made. It's as simple as that. Thanks.
so, uh, it, look, uh, you, you say you would do all of these things, but the effective tax rate on people under the system before universal credit was 90%. There were cliff edges for people working 16, 24, and 30 hours. Um, so, you know, it's not like the system has been perfect in the past. We, what we've done... The food hold, hold, banks hold, we hold, have today hold, hold, are nothing like hold, hold, what we had in that, the past. That, you know that. Well, in part, that's because you banned the Job Centre Plus oh, from even nonsense. signalling, signposting it's, to people. It's, but the, but the pop, it's but, banal to suggest that, and you know that. Uh, I, sorry, I, look, I, we have to work on the facts here, and the facts are that we need to pay for whatever it is that we uh, do provide. Uh, the universal credit system is working vastly better than the system that it replaced and actually handled the coronavirus increase in the number of people who required sis, uh, assistance uh, very well. I hear what Manira and others say uh, about the trap that people find themselves in, and Manira actually mentions that people would end up uh, having to pay 1% extra on their national insurance. Uh, perhaps I wasn't clear, £6 billion a year is the equivalent of not just one penny on income tax, it's a penny on income tax plus three pence on uh, fuel duty. So if you wanted to do that all through income tax, people would have even more money to pay in, in, in income tax. And as I was mentioning before, the £20 a week is one part of uh, a much, and the gentleman said it all sounded very complicated, tax and the way that the system works just is, I'm afraid. But it is the case, as, as, as I mentioned, that the national living wage has already increased by £4,000, okay. the amount of uh, people getting, something which didn't exist before doubling the tax threshold, the amount people could earn from 6500 to 12500 that's allowed people a okay. lot more tax-free earnings. So you've got to, you do, I'm afraid, have to look at the overall amount. Okay. And the COVID support, £407 billion so far, I, I think everyone uh, appreciates that we have to pay for it somehow and it can't go on ad infinitum as we move out of this period. All right, I'm going to move on to take another question. But before I do, I just want to tell you that next week we'll be in Birmingham with uh, West Streeting from Labour and the former inhabitant of Love Island, Amy Hart. The following week, uh, which is the 7th of October, will be an Aldershot and comedian Rosie Jones will be on the panel. So if you live in either Birmingham or Aldershot, I cannot tell you how exciting it is to be doing a shout-out for an audience since we haven't done it for a year and a half. Uh, if you live there or in the surrounding area, do come along and join us. You can go to the Question Time website and be part of the audience and we would love to hear from you. Right, let's take another question, which is from Brian, Brian Stacey. What should the UK do to fill the estimated 100,000 HGV vacancies and avoid empty shelves this Christmas? Well, Richard, I think you are probably the best qualified to take us through this to begin with. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, HGV drivers, right. Uh, well, we as a company are about 100 short. Um, as a nation, we're about 100,000 short. And we have a, a long-term uh, structural issue in this country in that we have an aging population of HGV drivers around uh, the average age of, of 57. Uh, so we desperately need to, to recruit uh, new drivers. And of course, that's the right thing to do. And is the, is the prospect of empty shelves or fewer things on shelves solely because of HGV drivers or are there other issues No, as I mean, well? um, it's coming at us from all angles at the moment. We have the CO2 issue, uh, we have HGV, we have a... Uh, shortage of, of workers in, in factories and, and fields and processing plants. Um, it, it's very difficult out there. And uh, my staff have been nothing short of heroic, uh, as have the HGV drivers, in terms of keeping the wheels turning over the last 18 months throughout the pandemic. We haven't closed a single store. We haven't missed a single delivery. But now we are having to do so. And we're, close, we're missing up to 80 deliveries a day to our stores. Um, this is a real issue that is now impacting the supply into our stores. Um, and what about Christmas then? I know you... I say I know. I imagine you will, you will want to be careful in terms of not yes. panicking everybody. I, I, yeah. But no, as candid as you can be with us, here you are on question time, what are the shelves going to look like at Christmas? Well... Uh, I think we all have a responsibility to play. You know, the, the media does not need to sensationalise this. I no, no, that's why I'm asking do you. We don't need to encourage any panic buying. And uh, we, we are fully stocked. We have full availability at the moment. Um, so when I, the head of Tesco says there will be some things that will not be available at Christmas? Yeah, well, we're different. We, you know, we specialise in Frozen, which has sure. longer lead times. So um, I'm, I'm perhaps more confident than them. But uh, I do think it's an issue. 
And it's an issue that if it's not sorted, will get worse very quickly because we are stock building now for Christmas, which is the peak time of year. And uh, our deliveries are going down at exactly the wrong time when they need to go up. Um, now, potentially one of the benefits of Brexit was that we will see wage inflation domestically, and we're now giving double-digit um, wage uh, increases uh, to our HGV drivers, which is a good thing. Um, and that, that all cost us money, but it's the right thing to do. Um, however, recruiting and training those HGV drivers will take six to nine months, and before then we have Christmas. Uh, so I think the, the uh, solution, even if it's temporary, is very, very simple. Let's get HGV drivers onto the skilled worker list, which incidentally includes ballerinas and concert orchestra musicians. But it and just to explain, so that means they can come over from the so EU exactly. and work here in, in a perfectly straightforward Exactly fashion. right. Now, I know Europe has its own issues with HGV drivers, but of course it's a bigger pool to, to fish from. And I think that will ease uh, potentially the issue that I am really quite worried about as we start to run into Christmas and also have to deal with all of the issues, other issues that, that we're currently facing as an industry. Manir. Uh, well, I agree with a lot of what Richard said, and um, let's hope and pray we're not facing um, shortages this Christmas. But talking to some uh, leaders in the industry this week, I understand that we are likely to have far less choice. Um, and given the pressures because of the CO2 shortage, the HGV driver crisis, we are already seeing prices going up. And as we've just been talking about, there are many families that are really going to struggle to make ends meet this Christmas. So what should the government so be So I agree that there should be, uh, they should be looking at a uh, visa solution to be able to bring in uh, migrant workers. It's clear that the, uh, with the immigration changes, I think with COVID, lots of European drivers went home and they haven't come back again. So putting in place uh, a visa route for them to be able to come back, I think is important. But there are also long-term changes in the labor market, as I think Richard alluded to, and we know some of the tax changes around self-employment, for instance, um, and the demographic changes in that workforce, are meaning that you know, this is not a short-term problem. And what we need to see for a just-in-time supply chain is some long-term planning, but unfortunately, we've got a just-in-time government that tends to lurch from crisis to crisis. We need to do some proper contingency planning around our, our workforce. This isn't just about HGV drivers. We're seeing shortages in our farms, in picking and packing food, as well as getting it onto supermarket shelves. And we know that it might not be the case for Iceland, but for some other supermarkets, we know there's been about a drop in a quarter of the fulfillment of their deliveries on their shelves. And that will mean that probably we'll all have far less choice this Christmas. The man here in the front in the, in the blue jacket with the glasses. Yeah, I'm just wondering if, if this is not a golden opportunity to think about more carbon neutral ways of transporting goods, uh, you know, across country, continents, etc. Not sure if you get that up and running for Christmas, but, no, but long, no, term, but I mean long term, long term, <laughs> possibly. Yes, the man behind you in the striped shirt. Um, thank you. Um, you hear a lot of stories from lorry drivers who are leaving saying that basically it's not fun anymore. Their working conditions have deteriorated over the last 20 years, whereby there are far fewer places for them to go. They're restricted access areas. They are t monitored in their cabs by cameras. They are penalised for being late. Um, in the olden days, they used to be able to take their wives with them. Now, you know, that's not allowed for insurance and things like that. And people are just finding it a really... Yeah. It's been put in a way that makes their working conditions much harder for them and much more unenjoyable. So that's another reason why they're leaving. Not in the back there. Yeah, I understand that the, uh, the government need to recruit more HD drivers, but I'm really concerned that they seem to be making their licence easier to get. In particular, you don't need to have a, a car licence now. You can immediately apply for an HGV licence, which to me just seems like a, 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 an accident waiting to happen on the road. Do you think they're making it too easy? That's what I've heard, yes. I mean, Grant, when you hear what Richard says, uh, and, and lots of uh, industry uh, bosses in, 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 uh, in the supermarket supply chain have been saying, just give uh, low-skilled worker visas to the HGV drivers, at least in all the things that are going, mm. going uh, you know, wrong at the moment, that's one thing mm. you could sort out. Why don't you just do yeah. it? Yeah, look, if that was actually the solution, I, I'm sure we move to it very quickly, and I don't rule out anything. But, but some, the, Richard thinks it's but, at least part of the solution. Do you not agree? I, I understand that, but, I, I mean, this is my subject area. I've been working on it for the last two and a half years, and, and it's not something that we're suddenly doing just in, in time. Uh, in fact, I worked on a road to logistics programme with the haulage sector as one of the very first things that I introduced. 
This is a global problem. It has come directly as a consequence of coronavirus. And in particular, oh. we had to close all of the <laughs> testing for HGV drivers at the DVSA, the testing centres throughout the most of the crisis. And that's led to a specific bottleneck, which is very hard for people to, it was very hard for people to get their licences, of course, because uh, they were closed. And there's an attrition rate for a lot sure. of the reasons that people saying, have mentioned. As someone whose profession this is, if you introduce low-skilled working visas for HIV drivers, it yeah. would at least solve part no, of the problem really look, help. Look, so look if, I thought it, if I thought it would, I, I, I would do it. We already have six million Europeans with settled and pre-settled um, status. But if you go to Europe, Poland, 123,000 shortage. Uh, Germany, 60,000 shortage. The bottleneck is actually people getting tested uh, and also bringing people back into the market. And for some of the reasons that have been mentioned, uh, uh, Richard and other people have mentioned it, this is a market in which 99% of lorry drivers, a white male, average age 55 to uh, 57. Uh, and it's because the conditions haven't been pleasant, but it's also because the pay hasn't been commensurate with the job, the inconvenience, the long hours or the nights and uh, sleeping in the cabin and things like that, and the conditions at truck stops. And these are things that we can do something about. And a higher salary is something that we are happy to see. We don't think, pe we think people should be able to work a hard day's work and get paid a proper wage for it. This is something which will correct a systemic problem, which has led to shortages for a long time, because it has been constantly that undercut will, by people coming in being prepared to do the work. I'm uh, worried about cheaper. Christmas before that. No, I'm, I understand so that. You, so you the, think not adding them to the skilled worker list would make no uh, difference? Well, no, whatsoever. what I'm saying is the, the decision here is whether it would actually make any difference to do so by Christmas. What I can tell you is I've already taken a series of measures. The gentleman up there mentioned about safety when it comes to testing. Bit of confusion in that. That's not the case. The tests are no easier. What we've done is to bring two parts of the test, articulated and rigid, lorry tests together in one, into one uh, test. Is, if you've been thinking about this for two and a half spaces. years, why have you only just done it? No, we haven't. Uh, we already consulted on it, so we were ready to go with that. I've opened up tests. The main problem, though, is the tests couldn't be run because of coronavirus, which is not something but anyone... But we, we now can't run. get any tests until December. No, that in the is south the of thing England. which we're improving because so the that's not tests help are coming available much more quickly. The Please, Grant, you, you keep talking and Rich keeps saying it's not going to help Christmas. And we're all sitting here thinking, what about Christmas? <laughs> yeah, so uh, let, me, let me just sort of set out. Very we're ready, briefly, because you set out a lot. Added, already. We've already added 50% to the number of tests that are available compared with pre-coronavirus. A couple of weeks ago, after a consultation and going through all the processes and changing uh, some of the testing uh, regime, doesn't make it any less safer, it simply means... Tests can be combined and done in a slightly different way. Uh, we'll have another 50,000 tests available, and these are all coming in prior to Christmas. So these are things, measures that will resolve the issues in the lead up to Christmas. Sooner the better. Yeah. <laughs> David. Well, what Grant Schnapps has just set out. Schnapps, uh, not Schnapps. <laughs> well, he must no, be on Schnapps. Maybe do it. He's got to be on the Schnapps. <laughs> <Because he's laughs> on the what we're looking at is a winter of discontent. That's what we're looking at. We have shortages of staff shortages of supplies and shortages of skills. How, why has this happened? It's For largely otherwise. happened because the promises that your party made on Brexit, which have not been delivered. No. Where is the trade deal with the United States? Where is the trade deal with India? We haven't got one. Why haven't you invested in further education? Where are the night schools? What have you done about it? Well, of course we need to get on with the visa, visa so that these people can come in. And so it's not to, just HGV. So to be clear. It's fruit pickers. So to be, it's caterers. So to be clear. It's people in concert let, halls. Right across this country, there are shortages. You promised that immigration would come down and you know that it will need to go up if we're to deal with these problems. The man there in the blue shirt. Uh, so we've been talking a lot about the um, delivery issues. I'm a store manager in retail and have been for a number of years. And it's incredibly difficult at the moment yeah. for store teams in and outside of, of the buildings. Um, last Christmas was really challenging with the lockdowns opening and closing. This year already we're facing difficulties getting products on the shelves. Isn't it about time that for all retailers to allow their teams to have time off on Boxing Day for, for the first time. I just think that really should just be a thing for, for all retailers. I know some big names have already kind of announced it, um, but surely you guys on the panel can do something about that to allow us to spend some time with our friends and with our family after working such an intense period through Christmas. Now, and are you, can I just ask, are you reassured by what you're hearing in terms of, in terms of what you're hearing from the government in terms of uh, sorting out the issues of 
Uh, what was that? So, sorry? Are you reassured by what you're hearing in terms of sorting out the issues of delivery? Um, not overly, because we've been seeing uh, like delivery issues for quite a while now, um, as have our customers, and you can only keep saying the same thing to them um, over and over. So I really think that the government needs to get a grip on this and just, just make it easier, because it's already tough as it is out on the high street. I, I just want to say thank you as well. I mean, you, have, you haven't had the option to work from home, unlike most industries, and uh, you're right, it's a, it's a very tough job, which is getting tougher. Um, and, and would you like to see him get Boxing Day off, your yes. own workers? Yes, I would, yeah. <laughs> Right, if anyone from Iceland is watching, they will yeah. have it here. <laughs> Kate? I, I've just scuppered in an announcement next week. So. <laughs> so are you definitely doing that, then? Uh, I better say it now. Yes, we are. Yeah. There we are. <laughs> Kate? If you want to get thousands more HGV drivers on the road, you raise wages, you improve their working conditions. If you want workers such as yourself to stay in the job and not to look for one of the million job vacancies that now exist in the UK to go elsewhere to improve their conditions, then you need to do so. Workers in many ways at the moment are becoming the new bosses. They can ask for a lot more than they could before. Average wages have skyrocketed. These shortages, the flip side of it, there are lots of problems with it, but the flip side of it is that wages are going up, Workers who got us through the pandemic, the people who couldn't stay home, who were in the shops, who were delivering the packages, who were driving on the road, they are about to be valued. They are about to be valued so much more than they were the decade before when they were struggling for stagnant wages. And I am really torn on this one because as somebody who was very supportive of Brexit and thinks it has a lot of opportunity, I was also devastated to see free movement go. I've, I've always been a, a big advocate of free movement. But if there is a benefit to what has happened, is that native workers are about to get that big pay raise, and they so, so deserve it. And I think Grant's right that even if you added lorry drivers to the skilled working list, this shortage is across Europe now. It is not at all obvious that would solve the problem overnight. Workers are now empowered to ask for more money. They should do. They should ask for better working conditions. This is their moment. If in terms of winners and losers, and there always are, it is the workers who got us through the pandemic uh, that are about, I think, to have some real winnings come their way, and I'm excited to see it. Okay. We've got another question from Catherine Bass. Hi. Um, do you agree that the police should have extra powers to remove climate change prote uh, protectors? Protesters. So yes, thank seen you. These, we've seen these protests on, on the M25. Yes, the government's yeah. now taken out an injunction. What do you think, Catherine? Well, so I'm a self-employed florist. I work for myself, obviously. And um, I was thinking about that. I was listening to the Jeremy Vine show, as I do every day. And um, they were talking about it. And I, I was quite upset in a way, because if you're stuck there, like in my case, for example, if I have a coffin spray in the back of my, my delivery van, and I can't get to that funeral because the, the road is blocked, then that's not very nice for these people, especially I've worked all through the pandemic as well by myself because I, um, I got the flowers direct delivered from Holland, so I, I was actually possible to do that. I didn't have to go to the wholesalers, so they stuck it in my home garage where I worked behind closed doors. So I've done um, loads and loads and loads of funerals. And then, though, to have to deal with that hardly anyone could go to the funerals. That was really hard for me as well. And do you think, do you think the police should have extra powers to stop the N25 protesters? Well, I think, I think they should do more about it. You know, I've, I've, I've listened okay. so much to the radio um, the last 18, 22 months. And, yeah, sometimes my heart is just uh, going a bit crazy about things. And um, also, if you're, for, for example, a, a, a mother with a baby in, in the back, and then you're stuck for five hours there, maybe your, your, your bottle sure. runs out. What are you going to do? So yes, exactly. Can I just ask, does anyone here support uh, the, what the, the protesters are doing on the M25 and think it might be inconvenient, but actually it's, it's the right thing to do? You've got your hand up there. It's inconvenient and it's, it's not the best way, but if the government did something about things, they wouldn't have to take those actions. So if, do something and then they'll stop. The man, the man at the back in the grey top. Yeah, um, I, I agree with the lady. Uh, there wouldn't be a problem if the government did something about climate change. Instead of claiming to be, you know, the leader of the world in climate change, why don't we actually do something about it instead of just claiming? OK, well, listen, let's come back to the question. Do you agree the police should have extra powers to remove climate change protesters? So, Grant, you have 
just managed to give the police extra powers because you've got a temporary injunction to stop the protesters protesting on the M25 mm. itself, nowhere else. Is that enough? Are you going to go yeah. further? Are you happy with that? Look, I, I am actually completely with the lady who asked the, the question. There, it is completely irresponsible. It's totally dangerous to walk onto a motorway. They're putting their own lives and the lives of people on the motorway at risk. It's counterproductive because the traffic stands there causing the pollution they claim uh, they care about in their homes, which turn out not to be insulated. Uh, and uh, I cannot imagine why on earth anyone would think it was a good idea to step onto a motorway like that. Uh, that's why I asked uh, National Highways, who run our motorways, uh, to get hold of an injunction, uh, which they did uh, the other night. Um, uh, that injunction is uh, now in place. Um, but the reality is uh, that if we want to solve climate change, uh, that is something that this government is passionate about doing. We're moving towards uh, uh, electric vehicles. We've got a transport decarbonisation, a plan for it, which no other country in the world has, has got. We've been I mean, the committee on climate change than says, any other country in the, the G7. The committee on climate change says you are not on track to meet your net zero target by 2050. Well, the committee... And you, your, your, your policies have yet... Or your, your ten-point plan has yet to be backed the, by the, firm policy. The committee on climate change, I think I'm right in saying, made that before we set the latest carbon budget, gets very technical, it's called CB6, which puts us on... Which we, if we achieve, of course, will put us on track... Um, to do it. But, you know, perfectly legitimate for people to protest. We have an open democracy where people should be able to do that. But walking onto a motorway, putting their lives and others and the emergency services at risk, it's completely out of order. And that's why I stepped in to stop it. Okay. David, will you be comfortable if some of these protesters go to prison? Uh, yes, because... I support the right to protest, absolutely. I don't support the government in some of the changes that they've made to protest, but you have to protest within the law. Um, I think there was a woman who ended up with some paralysis this week because she couldn't get to hospital, and that underlies the problem. Um, uh, so I think the High Court were right in their decision. Um, the powers, I think, are there. I'm not sure the police are asking for further powers. Um, so, uh, yes, people should protest, and yes, there's room also for civil disobedience, but I think some of what we've seen uh, is actually not commanding the support of the public. And, and the whole point of temporary. protest is to command the support of the public, and that's clearly not happening. And these powers are temporary. Would you like to see them permanently? I think the police are not asking for more powers. So the powers are there, and I think the High Court's decision sends a powerful signal to both, signal to both the protesters and the police about what's expected. Man there in the pale blue shirt, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think people might find their uh, methods questionable, but the government says that it's uh, serious about, or passionate about mm. climate change. Mm. Um, Boris Johnson today is talking about a turning point for humanity. He's referencing Kermit the Frog. Um, it's not easy being green. Yeah. Spending each day the colour although, of belief. Although he says it is easy to be green, and yet they're investing in major infrastructure projects like East West Rail that connects to Cambridge and Oxford, which will put diesel trains, new railway with diesel trains, you know, on a major new railway. And that, to me, is the government heading very definitely down the wrong track, or Boris perhaps treating us all like Muppets. <laughs> Man here. Um, I don't think that blocking a road is the right way to go about things, but I do think that the more restrictions you put on people's rights to protest, the more of a sort of state we're becoming, where if you want to speak out, if you want to make your feelings heard, you're just put down straight away. You're putting an extremist column, and you just you can't say what you truly but believe. But would you be happy if you were sitting on the M25 trying no, to... No, I wouldn't. I don't support that, but I believe that the more restrictions we put... It's like, where, did, where does it end? OK, the man in the back in the white shirt. Um, two things. One, I look at the different... Not the ones on the M25, but before, and I get the impression that the police don't seem to have control of it, whether they're too soft, whether there's not enough of them. They must have the intel to, to prepare for this. The second thing, if it were me, and I'm not a politician, I'd take one of them HGV lorries where they're sitting, I'd arrest them, put them in that wagon and send them to the top, top of Scotland and make their own way back and stop them from bleeding doing it. Because it just... I wonder how Scotland would feel about that. <laughs> well, well, they might 
there's, but the thing for me is, <laughs> they're, they're right in what they're, what they're doing, as in... In the principle, change. you think? They're, they're, they're right in that, but the way that they're doing it, just really making people's days really bad and horrible. And they shouldn't be doing that, because if they want support, they better take us with them. And if they don't, they're going to be like they are now. Most of us agree with what they're, what they're about, but not the way they're doing it. And they'll lose that support, and then, in the end, it will be for nothing. I mean, the point they make is unless they do something very big and noisy that everyone notices, life yeah, just carries but, on. Yeah, but if they went to Moscow, Peking, Bombay, and started doing it where it's a real problem, you'd go, well done, we'll have some of that as well. But they don't. It's too easy here okay. because we make it too easy. But we agree with what they're saying, but come on, get a grip yourselves. OK. And I'm always sceptical to give the police more powers, and we don't need to in this circumstance. It's already an offence to obstruct a highway. Uh, so I don't think that's a necessary thing to do. I think the police have a tough job at the moment in figuring out how to facilitate this, but the reality is if you form a protective circle around people sitting in the middle of a motorway, they're going to keep sitting there. And there's a reason we don't go sit in the middle of motorways. I mean, not that that's how many of us would want to spend our time anyway. Um, but I think there does need to be a really hard line on this. I completely agree with the right to protest and protecting those very sacred rights. But this isn't normal protest. This is just absolute destruction and chaos. And it is jeopardizing people's lives in the back of ambulances. It's putting people in a, in a terrible situation. And I think David hit the nail on the head when he said that it's about swaying hearts and minds. And um, we're in a great position in the UK where if you look at the major parties, you might not like all their policies by any means, but their voting base is an agreement that we want to make this a greener world, that we want to tackle climate change. But you're not winning people over and you're not helping the cause when you just ruin someone's day or actually put somebody in danger. So this needs to be cracked down on and quite quickly. Manu? Let me be very clear. They have gone about campaigning on climate change in absolutely the wrong way and are putting the cause back uh, by the danger that they are creating, causing. Um, I mean, they might argue at least yeah. we're talking about it. Sorry? They might argue that at least we're talking about absolutely, it. Absolutely, but I think it's, it's important to say I don't agree with the means at all. The, the cause uh, I do agree with and, I mean, Grant says, you know, we're, we're a leader in climate change policies. I mean. These people are campaigning to insulate Britain, right? When the Liberal Democrats were in government uh, between 2010 and 2015, we had a zero carbon home standard, which was got rid of once the Tories were on their own. Not a single zero carbon home has been built since then. We had a, a, an obligation on energy companies to uh, pay for and support insulation of homes. That was scrapped. OK, so we, we, we need the reason why energy bills are going up, apart from the fact that uh, global prices have gone up, uh, is because our homes are not insulated very well at all. And therefore, if we want to cut fuel poverty, if we want to cut bills, if we want to cut emissions, we need to have an emergency insulation programme. So I absolutely agree with their aims, but I don't agree with the means. And I think we've seen this week, actually, that the police have all the powers they need to no, deal with them. The and uh, uh, no, but you went to the High Court, you got the injunction straight away, and through the injunction, you were able to take action. You don't need to go further as you are legislatively, where you're going to be cracking down on very peaceful protest, quite often against this government. It's, it's really sinister. So you're talking about the police crime sentencing That's in right. Bill. Richard. Well, I th you know, um, I think any rational person would uh, agree with their cause and any rational person would disagree with their methods, which are dangerous and idiotic um, and uh, disrupt people's lives. And as David um, referenced, it, it has destroyed one lady's life as well. Um, the whole environmental debate needs reframing, not to focus on cost and compromise, but it needs to, we need to talk about jobs and opportunity. Now, with re regards to the insulation elements, absolutely, you know, that is a, a clear thing that we can, must and should do, but I believe the government fully agree with that, um, and they'd like to insulate homes by 2035, but there's 20 million households in the UK, and it will cost on average about £1,000 to do so per household, so that's a lot of dough, so what we need now is to see a, a proper, well thought through, robust plan in terms of how we're actually going to scale this up um, as quickly as possible.
I'm not sure any rational person would agree with every single one of their claims. They come up with some pretty extreme stuff that isn't necessarily backed by the scientific community. And, and on top of that, let's point out another reason that energy bills are going up. It's because renewables, wind and solar, uh, this past month, past few months, haven't been as reliable as, as they have been in the past. It hasn't been as windy. We haven't had as much sun. Now, as somebody who would love to be able to move to a completely renewable system, who doesn't want a greener world? We're being a bit dishonest with ourselves about where we're actually at and what we can achieve. The only way we get to net zero by 2050, the only way we do this process Properly is if we bring people with us. And we need to be honest about the fact that we have been focused on decarbonization quite rightly, but the UK, more so than a lot of other European countries, has undermined its own energy security. We had far less gas reserve in the UK than Germany or France or Italy did. We're in a real bind now. So we need to have this honest conversation, and we might applaud their end goal, but I don't think it's fair to say that any rational person thinks that we should just adopt their policies overnight, whether they sit on the M25 or not. Well, it's it's is that dishonesty that's gotten us, partially gotten us into this energy crisis to begin with. Ultimately, what we need is a, a more diverse, greener, resilient energy mix. And yeah. it's not a binary choice of um, you know, fossil energy or non-fossil energy. We have the biggest tidal streams in the world. But if you speak the to the, the people on the M25, they may not, not like your nuanced those? answer, There's is my point. There's a whole host of other stuff. Hydrogen, you know, we're yep. already. We have Nuclear. amazing R&D. We need to scale that up. We, let's, we, let's talk about micro Speak Nuclear. to people on the M25, and they might not agree with your relatively nuanced position on this. That's so, what I'm slight, saying. So slightly off the actual question, which was about whether it was right for people to go on the M25 rather than the power supply, but, but both the other politicians on the panel have mentioned the police already having the powers. That was evidently not the case when the same people who were... Uh, protesting on the first day, we're out on the third day, and then on the fifth day, having been arrested each time in between. The reason I had to take an injunction was it was the only way to make that contempt of court okay. and therefore imprisonable, right. and supporting the police and crime bill would actually help folks, but neither but, of these guys are okay. doing that. But okay. you got the injunction that but you But only needed. on the M25. And what you're so saying... So now you're, you're suggesting saying... I get a judge to go out and do every single motorway separately. We need laws which do the obvious things that we all okay. agree with. I want, like to, get another, I want to get another question in, so I'm just going to move on, if I may. Sarah, Sarah Blaisby. The Prime Minister has said that we should all be able to see our GP face to face if we'd like to. How can GP practices be supported to provide quality care for patients? Manira. Sarah, I want to just start by saying that our GPs have done a phenomenal job throughout this pandemic. They've worked incredibly hard. Um, obviously, in the recent months, they've been rolling out the vaccination programme. Um, but they have been working throughout, uh, seeing people uh, initially largely remotely and now are doing a combination of both remote and OK, but the question is, Manira, how can GB practices be supported to provide quality care for patients so that we can see them face to face? I think that's what you're getting at, Sarah. Well, I think as we start to roll out the booster programme, booster jab programme, for instance, I think we should be relying much more on community pharmacy, for instance, and some of the vaccination hubs in my own constituency, the big vaccination hub has no, been No, no, the question down. is about seeing yes, but, GPs face-to-face, yeah, -face, not the, going to your pharmacy. No, no, but the point I'm making is that if there is less pressure on GPs from other things such as the vaccination programme, they will be freed up a bit more to see people face-to-face. Uh, we need investment in our in our GP surgery. We need to recruit and train far more GPs. There's huge workforce pressures across the NHS, GPs uh, being one of them. So it's about it's about that long term investment. In the short term, it's trying to find ways to free them up so that they can see you face to face. And don't forget, there are people who actually prefer the remote triage. So where people are happy to be seen remotely, that's probably a, a, a quicker way to be seen. But uh, then that frees up okay. time for people Let me just to be put able this to in see others I'm face in, to face. I'm not in touch with the vaccinations is, is the issue. As far as I'm aware, most vaccinations happen outside GP surgeries. But the, Royal College, the head of the Royal College of GPs uh, has been addressing this issue. There's been, um, it, it was pre-pandemic that 80% uh, of appointments were carried out face-to-face -to -face with GPs. It's now something like 57%. Mm. And the head of the Royal College of GPs says he thinks 56% is about right. So you then have the Prime Minister saying people should actually should be able to see their GP face-to-face -face if they want to. So you've asked this question, is this because you're involved, you're a GP, or have you got a personal interest um, in Just this? a patient, and I understand the pressures on the system. It's just, what can we do? What can we do to help? And do you want to be able to see your GP face-to-face -face when you want um, to? Ideally, yes. Yes, ideally. So 56% is about right. That's what 
the head of the Royal College is saying. Richard, does that sound right to you? Um, well, you know, speaking as a, a, a patient <laughs> um, at times myself, and I, we referenced earlier in, in, in the show that my uh, frontline colleagues haven't had the option of, of being able to work from home. It doesn't feel to me as a patient right, and I'm really quite nervous about um, the lack of face-to-face -face contacts with GPs and therefore missing the nuances, um, the, you know, the, the small things that potentially you can only get from a face-to-face -face consultation. Now, uh, GPs are under enormous workload, um, but these are the, the terms of the job that they signed up for. And maybe a balance is, is, um, is now available where there's things like the pill, for example, which you have, still have to have a GP's appointment for, which you know, seems um, uh, a bit ridiculous to, to have to actually visit the GP. Um, but all it does, the GPs are the gatekeepers for the NHS. And actually, I've, I've done this myself. When I can't get a GP's appointment, I've gone to A&E. Now, what pressure does that put under our NHS? It's not right, and therefore, I think um, they should work face-to-face -face wherever possible. Man over there. I think the uh, chair of the Royal College of General Practitioners, 56%, just betrays a, com a complete misunderstanding of, of what the patients of his members want. And they might not want 100% face-to-face, uh, -face, but I'm pretty sure that it's a damn sight more than 56 um, if he thinks that 56 is about right, then he's very wrong. So, Grant, NHS England changed their guidance in May, which had been the COVID guidance, so that it was a kind of triage system, mm. so you didn't get... So, so a lot of appointments were remote. That, that was changed, but then actually GPs just carried on doing remote yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah. No, I, look, I, I, I entirely agree with the, the questioner and actually other panel members. People should have the ability to go and see their GP. There are many times where you might present with one issue, but a G GP who's skilled will know that there may be some other underlying uh, issue or uh, ask you a question that leads you to go for a further checkup or whatever it is. So people should absolutely have that right So ability. when you've got the Royal College of uh, GP saying it's just undeliverable no, no, to be able no. to have face-to-face -face When you think like about that. that, how can that possibly be the case when before the pandemic they were managing... Um, to see virtually everybody face to face, I think the figures were even higher than 80%. I think uh, most GPs didn't even offer uh, a telephone or online service. So there's no reason why they can't um, go back to that. The NHS is re in receipt of more money than at any other time. And actually, this could be one of the places where the world's changed through coronavirus a lot. Uh, and actually, there are times, as somebody mentioned, where people might want to see. I can think of occasions where I might just want to phone or have an online appointment. And the fact that a few people do that should actually enable them to get through even more patients. There's no reason why people shouldn't be able to get that face to face. And that must be where we end with this. Woman here. Where is the money they're going to? I mean, is it going to private companies and not public companies? Because what, what do you mean? Where's the well, you keep saying to? that there's money in the NHS and social care, for example, but where is that money going? There's no evidence where it's going to. And and how are you funding things? Back in the picture. As a general public, if we do not allow us to see GPs face to face, that's going to cost lives. Well, that's the fear, isn't it? David Lemmy. There was a problem before the pandemic, so I think it's important that people can see their GP face to face, but that's not going to solve the problem because actually, before the pandemic, some people were waiting weeks to see their GP. The pandemic has made it worse. How do you fix the problem? We have a shortage of doctors right across the country. Um, and actually, there are also issues around space and infrastructure, particularly for a lot of single-handed GPs. And you've got to fix those issues as well. Um, I think it was NHS England that demonstrated that there's been a hell of a lot of missed um, diagnosis this year. Uh, over 20,000 missed diabetes cases pulmonary heart disease, heart failure, it's a whole set of things have been, have been missed. And so for that reason, it, it does seem likely that because people couldn't sit in front of their GP, you know, you know, your GP knows you, knows your family over many years, can ask the right questions. That can't all be done online. It can't all be done on the phone. That seems obvious to me. But it's not as straightforward as just being able to get back to see your GP if you can't see your GP for four to six weeks. And for some practices, that was the case. In the glasses. Can I just add that my GP will see me face to face a lot, but there is one GP in our practice that if you do need to see them face to face, it's nearly impossible and it all has to be done via the phone, which I think is 
wrong when people are saying that you can get in, supposed to be able to see the GP face to face. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's great that now we can use remote contact with GPs to get a new prescription or deal with something very small, but that isn't really the point here. I'm, I'm pleased that we've moved into a world where that's possible, but the point is that for 18 months, patients have more or less been put off going to the NHS. It got so bad at the end of last year that the NHS had to come up with its own slogans to try to recruit people back to the NHS because we were worried about capacity for understandable reasons, but it has meant that so many people have gone missed, over 5 million people now in England on these waiting lists. And if we owe any group of people anything, it is those who are sick and vulnerable and who did not get seen in a good amount of time to be able to get all of the access to the care that they need now. And that has to start with being able to see your GP. Now, I don't pretend for a moment that that's easy, but GPs are earning somewhere between two to three times what your average earner in the UK is. They need to be back in the office and they need to see patients who want to be face to face. For those who already know that they're sick and can't get treatment, for those who don't know that they're sick yet, and for those who are just anxious and nervous about what might be down the road. We're talking in some cases about life or death. Surely after the year of COVID, year and a half of COVID, we now really understand what life and death means. And that shouldn't just apply to the virus, it should apply to every major illness. And those patients deserve the time and the treatment as well. Yes. I think that trying to do a 10 minute appointment is really tight and maybe they could have a little bit more time as well. So it's not only getting to see them, but then yeah. seeing for long yeah. enough. Yeah. I mean, Grant shouts, fewer than one in four GPs work full time. Uh, that's a figure given by NHS England. And the Conservative government has been talking has had at least two goes at recruiting more GPs. Mm. We actually have fewer GPs now than we had in 2015. If you'd sorted that out, would that not have made this problem rather Well, as, uh, you know, uh, uh, as David says, there, there are uh, shortages of people coming into the uh, profession, I think, but I, I don't have the GP number per se. I know that doctors and nurses' numbers are... Uh, There's a, a shortage of 2,500 full-time GPs, according to the King's Fund. Yeah. And, and look, I mean... I, and there I, are almost 2,000 fewer full-time GPs yeah. now than in 2015. Uh, as I, you've got some numbers there which I haven't seen, but I do know that overall doctors and nurses' numbers are significantly up, and actually unusually... I but agree, not GPs, I think, which is what we're talking yeah, about here. Uh, but uh, you know, the point I'd make is that uh, we should be able to use the uh, fact that they have been able to open up online services and there will be some people who are happy to do that because it's convenient for their lives to be able to see more people over any given um, day. And the fact that not enough GP services uh, are opening up isn't acceptable. Uh, we absolutely think everybody has a right to see a GP face to face. OK, our hour is up. There's quite a few hands up. Forgive me, we, we are out of time. I'd love to come to all of you. Thank you very much to the panel for coming along tonight. To our audience here, it's only our second week with an audience. Just lovely to see you here. And, of course, to you at home for watching. Thank you so much. And if you want to keep watching, Laura Koonsberg, my friend and colleague, is on Newscast on BBC One after this. But from Question Time, bye-bye. <laughs>